Hey everyone, James Azar here for this week's CISO Talk. I hope you're ready for an awesome episode today because I brought in a CIO on the show today who's going to talk to us CISOs a little bit and help bridge and create relationships and partnerships and learn and, and talk a little bit about uh, security from the point of view of a CIO. And, you know, this person's not just an IT guy. He's absolutely unbelievable. You're going to love JJ once he comes on the show. And stay tuned for that. So if it's your first time watching CISO Talk, thanks so much for giving us a chance and tuning in. The show runs about 45 to 55 minutes. We do this weekly every Wednesday. So please make sure to subscribe. Give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast listening platform. You can also follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at CyberHub Podcast. Um, go tune in there. You can also watch all of our shows. You can see different skits and so forth, things that we do uh, from an audio and, and video perspective that are that are greater uh, there as well. So make sure to do that. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Nobefore, Wistic, and Ativo Networks. You can check out more about them in the show notes. And now without further ado, you've subscribed, you've followed. You can also follow me. You can see all that stuff in the show notes. Let's get right into today's episode. Here we go, folks. From the Cyber Hub Bunker and Studio, you're listening to the CISO Talk Podcast. No sales, no bullshit, just straight talk. Straight talk. And now for your host and CISO, James Azar. Mr. Jason, how are you doing, good sir? I am doing well. How are you, James? I am doing very, very well. So we have two JJs on today's show. So I'll be James, you'll be JJ, and that's how people will refer to us in the comment section going forth. Well, great. I've sort of made a brand out of it, at least in Atlanta, so that, that should work. <laughs> I love it. So thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You know, one of the uh, I kind of want to start off today's episode by talking a little bit about how your career got started in in tech, how you ended up in IT, and and how's it all come together with security, if you don't mind. Sure. So every job I've ever done has been in IT. So I grew up. I first of all, I am CIO for NetHealth, which is headquartered in Pittsburgh. I live here in Atlanta. I grew up about a couple hours southeast of here in Alabama. Uh, in fact, the town I grew up in was most famously known as the backdrop for Norma Ray. So I'm the first generation on either side of my family never to work in a cotton mill. And so when I was 15 years old, my dad worked for the, the city of Opelika as HR director. And I was 15 and summer was coming around and he said, oh, do you want a summer job? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I can get you a job mowing grass in the cemetery. And I said, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and he said, well, what about, you know, working in a grocery store, bagging groceries? I was like, mm, that ain't me either. I'm not going to do that. He said, uh, what about a restaurant, being a waiter or something? I was like, mm, I'm damn sure not doing that. I said, give me two weeks to come up with something and um, I'll do it. And he said, OK. And so my parents always being very supportive, uh, let me go off on my own. Two weeks later, I started doing uh, PC upgrades and laying out Lantastic networks at 15. Uh, I'm dating myself. Most of your viewers are like, what the hell is Lantastic? Think of it as networking for dummies. OK. And so uh, when minimum wage was four and a quarter, I was making twenty five dollars an hour doing these upgrades, doing these network designs. And that sort of got me into IT. Every job since then has been in IT. In fact, when I was 19 years old, I was attending Auburn University. I bought the value added reseller I was working for, decided to move away from college students and focus on small and medium businesses. Um, after that, you know, I, I sold the company. I took a sabbatical from my uh, college education, would later uh, go back and finish my undergrad and graduate degree while working full time. But um, it sort of evolved. I've always been drawn to technology. Uh, security was uh, has been part of that for so long. I can't even remember how long. I remember, you know, putting in early generation firewalls and you know load balancers and you know getting on the more network side. From a from a CIO perspective, I come from the infrastructure background. I remember being told. I won't say what recruiter it is, but. Uh, they told me years ago, oh, you want to be a CIO, you have to come from the, you know, product and engineering side, you know, a developer. And I thought, what a load of crap. 
Uh, well, <laughs> since uh, I've been CIO more than twice, I can say that was a load of crap. So for those of you listening that come from the network side or come from the infrastructure side or security side, and you have aspirations to be a CIO or CTO someday, you go for it. Yeah, that's uh, that. I, I love that story. By the way, you know, it's um, you, you're kind of a self starter, right? Did you have any mentors? Did you reach out to any mentors along the way to kind of grow? You know, if when so, you, how'd you do that? Yeah, when you think about it, early on it was super hard to even get a mentor. Of course, my late father was my first mentor. Uh, you, you're never too old to have a mentor. You're never too young to be a mentor. But you know, when I think about that, as I grew my career. Um, there were certain CIOs along the way, certain people that were extremely supportive of my career. For those in the Atlanta market, of course, there was Jay Farrow. Um, Jay has been a great mentor. Uh, for the sake of transparency, I ultimately went to work for Jay. Jay has a habit of producing the next generation CIOs. I think there's six of us. I was number five. So uh, I did not break his streak. Uh, usually when you're his second in command, your next role is CIO. So uh, luckily, it's been part of that. You know, the, the CIO community here in Atlanta is extremely supportive. Uh, there's plenty of peers that I can go to and talk to and we share advice, whether it be, you know, security best practices or or leadership best practices. And that's important. What I do encourage those from a leadership perspective, if you've made it to the top, it's your obligation to send the elevator back down. So I believe in the power of mentoring. Uh, I'm mentoring a couple students right now at Albany State as part of an organization I belong to. Uh, I've done mentorship out of um, TechBridge with uh, some of their students. But the idea is it's important to give back. And so, you know, um, you know, I was luckily enough, uh, lucky enough to have those. Uh, for those of you looking for a mentor, look at somebody that you admire, not just you know, professionally, but maybe personally. I remember I was uh, with a company, um, we got acquired uh, by a very large company, I won't say who, and they assigned me a mentor. And I'm like, assigned a mentor? What the hell are you talking about? And uh, it was the CIO at the time. I was just telling uh, this story the other day and the, the guy was, I'll be frank, he was a jackass, like <laughs> extremely rude, uh, talked down to everybody. And I kept thinking, what would I mimic anything in my career about towards this person? And it became this sort of reverse mentoring, this idea of here's what I would not do in my career. So if you are looking for a mentor, make sure you find somebody that has admirable traits, right? But at the end of the day, you are responsible for your career and you're trying to create what your career is, not mimic theirs. Yeah, that's a that, that that's a wonderful point about mentoring is you've got to be able to build the next generation of workforce, right? We're so you hear the numbers, especially in security, 20 million, 3 million. I don't know what the number is anymore, but I think 99% uh, of statistics and security are all made up, um, <laughs> right? 99% of statistics and security are all made up because I've never seen a statistic in security that's, you know, blasted that has a reference source, meaning that's got mm. a link to the right. reference that says, um, we've got this data when we did a survey of 2,500 global CISOs or CIOs about, you know, a lot of times I saw, tw I saw one that said, uh, there'll be 17 million cybersecurity job openings by 2025. And I said, how'd you reach this conclusion? How can you predict the future? Right. And you're in healthcare, you're, uh, you know, in healthcare, they had a nursing crisis. Right, where they couldn't get enough nurses. And a good friend of mine, Kevin Peterson, he's his wife's a nurse, and he reminded me of that. And I thought that was very smart of him. Um, Kevin said that you know how they solved the the nurse the nursing shortage crisis it goes automation. Mm -hmm. He goes because there was no way they were going to train enough nurses to deal with demand, so to develop technology that could be deployed instead. Well, I think we're seeing that in security. I mean, if you think about it, you think about, you know, your SIM and your, your alerts coming in. It's all becomes noise. You know, that's right. why you have tools that are able you to, you know, monitor that to escalate, which could be real risk. And I think what we're going to see, especially in the security sector, is more and more automation. And I'm not talking about robotic process automation. I mean, true artificial intelligence based automation that can take everything from threat analysis to uh, provisioning and hardening of environments, to all the, all the little things that we think of as security professionals that we're implementing that 
in some ways are monotonous, you know, in order to auto automate that, but also to order to be able to respond. If you think about a nation state attack, right, the amount of volume coming in, the amount of threat coming in, a small army of humans can't deal with that. And so the tools have to be more artificially um, intelligence based, but more automated in the sense that they're acting as your first level of defense. Yeah, I mean, that that's so true to me that that's automation mentorship is so it's so critical. Um, as you look at it, especially from a perspective of where the shortage today is in security, it's not an entry level roles. It's in no. that mid level role, right? It's no. the it's those team managers, those project managers. Um, it's 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 that middle mid management roles where we don't have enough people right now. It's really not. I, I'm not missing people on a red team. I, I post a red team job. I get you know 150 people applying for it. Right. Yeah. 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 It's true to that sense. And I think the other thing is that, especially when we talk about the importance of mentoring and the importance of mentoring within security, we have to be creating that next level because that is where the leadership will be. You know, in you know, it's it's also a very difficult role if you think about the role of CISO and the idea is many people have have avoided it because they're so afraid to be, you know, the scapegoat, so to speak. You know, when when we talk about security and accountability, there are two roles that are in the in the bullseye, so to speak, and that's the uh, CISO and the CIO, right? Those two roles are are held at a different level of accountability. Now that doesn't mean that everything they did was wrong. How many times have we met with executives, whether they be on the security side or IT side, that have been asking for additional funding for years or asking for additional tools or headcounts or whatever? At some point, the accountability extends even to the board, right? And so, um, but to go back to an earlier point, we've got to be mentoring these lower level and mid levels in order to create these next leaders that will be dealing with disaster. And avo hopefully avoiding disaster. Yeah, you you've that, that's that's absolutely true. It's we, we've got to be better role models. Um, and and one thing that I really liked what you said earlier is you're never too old to have a mentor, and you're never too young to be a mentor. And a lot of times people think of a mentor as being this you know elderly gentleman, mm -hmm. and and you right. know, th there, there's some wisdom there, obviously, right? But sometimes the younger people are also able to have they have the will skill and energy to do it a little bit better than some of the elder uh the, the yeah i like to call them the old gatekeepers right and, and but think of it even on a very basic setting you know i've got daughters and you know they're separated by almost two years of age in a lot of ways my younger one looks up well not a lot of ways she always does she looks up to that older one whatever she's doing it's not about just you know, she wants acceptance, but she's also learning. And so it gives my older daughter an opportunity to not just be a big sister, but be a mentor right. to try to help her, her little sister with whatever life comes at her, you know. And so mentoring can occur at any age. You know, uh, if you're two years ahead of somebody, you have that two years of wisdom that they don't. Right. And if you are that younger person, you have to realize that it's not about them trying to control you or push their ideas on you is they've seen it before. I remember, I, you know, I miss my grandparents. You know, I remember those stories of, you know, sitting, you know, uh, on the on the porch with my grandparents and listening to those stories. And th there were things that have stuck with me even this day. They've been gone for decades at this point. And it, it hit me the other day. These are the same stories and the same advice I'm still passing on to my daughters. And they, these are stories and, you know, lessons that they can learn from, from people who never lived in the age of technology, yep. that never lived in the world of the Internet, that never had an email address, that never went online, but instead still experience it. You know, at the end of the day, so much of what is old is new again. You know, everybody's talking about automation and driverless cars. And I saw a picture from the earliest uh, days of automotive with 12 cars plugged in and they were charging. A lot of people don't realize the earliest forms of automobiles were battery powered, right? So what is old is new again. And so sometimes we need to learn from others and we need to learn from the past in order to understand our future. The, by the way, the same applies to fashion, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's fashionable today was fashionable 40 years ago. 
yeah. you know, and, and, and so forth. You know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, leadership. As you're hiring, as you're building your team, what are some of the skills you look for? What are some of the X factor skills you look for for people to be part of the team over at NetHealth? And- yeah, I love people who are entrepreneurially driven, right? This idea of if you hit a wall, do you know how to go around it, right? You might not know every answer, but do you have the grit? Do you have the determination to try to figure it out, right? You, I don't want to hire somebody that has all the skill sets, but still doesn't have that drive to figure it out or to learn something new or go to that next level. I can teach tech. I can't teach personality. I can't teach determination, right? And so having those people that are ingrained with that, we can get them up to date on the skill sets. That's not the hard part, right? You know, um, the ability to interact with others. It doesn't matter what your job is. Very rarely these days are we just looking at logs, right? We're right. still having to interface with others. And the idea is, can you work with others? You know, there's a book by, I can't remember the psychologist's name, but it's called the no asshole rule. And the idea is if you hire people with toxic traits, they will make your environment toxic and you'll you'll have the best people leave. And so while we don't, I, I hate the term hire for cultural fit because generally that means you're hiring the same thing over and over again. I don't want that, but I want people that know how to interact with others regardless of their background. I think, again, the idea is you want diversity. You want diversity not only in gender and and, and race, but you also want gender of background or, or diversity of background. The idea is the more diversity you can have, the stronger you can make a team. You know, I, you know, we work in the healthcare IT space. I hire people from all over, right? I do not have a bias to just hire from the healthcare space. I believe if we want to change the healthcare industry, we have to hire from the outside. And so I'll bring in people from the enterprise. I'll bring in people from academia. I'll bring in people from fintech because at the end of the day, data is data. The regulations and the protective measures around them may change. But, you know, we're trying to hire that diversity of background and diversity of experience and diversity of person in order to make a better organization. I I love the diversity in background. I'm a big person that believes in diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diversity of thought to me is critical to any successful organization, period. And by the way, this great nation of ours was built on diversity. Um, yeah. People forget that um, the five bureaus in New York were built by five diverse people. You know, this country is great because in Europe, everyone was divided. Then they all came here and they're like, um, the Italians had to work with the Irish and the Brits and the Germans and all these different people. And they were like, okay, now we all got to build together and make something great. And they did. Right. Um, so I always find that to be kind of like the the reason why sometimes when people, you know, go overseas, they go, I don't understand. You know, some of the stuff looks very similar to what we see here in the States, but other stuff is, is completely different. And like, well, understand the difference in, in the U.S. was as the country was being built, we took in immigrants from all kinds of different walks of life in different parts of the world. And they all came here and they all shared the American dream and they yeah. work together to, to do it. And you need the same today in technology, right? We need people from all walks of life, from all different sure. backgrounds in order to create the great technology like we create, like our forefathers created in this country. Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, I, I'm just a third generation uh, American. And I think about how different the world has gotten since my grandfather, you know, so my grandfather grew up near Grant Park. I used to live on Peachtree Street, right in the heart of Midtown. My grandfather, if I'd have gone back and been in that same spot and went back 70 years prior, he would have been delivering fruits and vegetables via horse cart, you know, up and down Peachtree and the amount of houses there and and all that. And it's, you know, to think about how uh, coming from a diverse background and, uh, you know, at, at some point being a third generation American and how we view uh, what we have and what got us here. And the, the fact is, to your point, James, is like everybody had to try to work together because, you know, we at one point we didn't have enough people. You know, we're, right. we're one of the few countries on Earth that literally gave land away in the great, you know, 
push across West is you could get there and you could homestead and you could, if you could get the land, it was yours. And so we had people uh, from all over the world come in and that's what built America. To your point, I think what we do need is that same diversity in technology because, and especially if we start talking about securing assets, right? Is that we need this diversity of thought, this diversity of background, because at the end of the day, we can all learn from each other. You know, if you if you look at the ransomware that is attacking utilities, that same kind of attack had been occurring in healthcare. Uh, but we can learn from people in fintech because you know they, they've been a little bit better positioned against that kind of attacks. And so having all this diversity come together from different backgrounds and say, oh look you aren't doing this. We were doing this in fintech. We need healthcare. We need utilities to implement, you know, EDR, or the fact is you need, you know, a better segmentation and segregation of, of backups. And I think, you know, it puts us at a very unique position to go, let's start thinking about our industry, every industry as needing diversity. You know, I worked in oil and gas for a while and people in oil and gas think they're completely different than everybody else. I've worked in fintech. They think they're very different than anybody else. Data is data. The regulations of not protecting that data change, right? You know, right. PCI is different than HIPAA, but at the same time, how you protect that data, how you measure that data, how you contain that data is basically the same thing. It's just the penalties for not doing it are different. Yeah, that's, a, uh, you know, uh, when people always tell me that, you know, fintech is different from healthcare, and healthcare is different from critical infrastructure. I, I try to laugh a little bit, you know, and laugh it off because it's it's either a lack of understanding of how it all interfaces, or it's just you heard someone somewhere say it. It sounded good to you because people mm -hmm. nod their heads when you're speaking, and you yeah. keep using it, right? Um, data is data is data. Security, is security is security. Security challenges are pretty much identical. And I guarantee you, if, if I got a room of 100 of us tomorrow, right, and we went and we we sat down at, you know, uh, Buckhead Diner and had a conversation and everyone put on headphones, right, so they couldn't hear anything. And I went around the room and asked everyone the same question and had them all say their answer. All the answers would be pretty much identical. Oh, absolutely. And it's my encouragement out there to hiring managers, regardless of industry, is you need to start looking at people who are capable of doing the job or capable of learning the job and don't be so hung up on the industry or vertical they came from. Yeah. You nailed that right on the head. I definitely agree with that. Um, Naomi, and uh, I don't know if you know, Naomi Buckwalter, she's the CISO at Confidential. I don't want to put her on blast, um, but um, Naomi does a lot of trigger posts around that of the idea of, of how she uh, how she got hired and, and, and how a lot of times there's old gatekeepers keeping people from getting into the industry because of, you know, trying to make, I think, security and IT harder than what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, maybe I'm off here, might trigger some people, but I don't think security or IT is that hard. If you know how to put together a puzzle, if you know how to connect a pipe and multiple ends and know that something's got to go in on one side and it's got to come right. out the other side and you can't have anything happen in the middle, then you can do any any job if you just understand that, then everything else I can teach. And it's it's all it all can be learned, right? It's right. It, it's the same as playing the piano. Some people might pick it up a little bit more easily. Uh, some people might struggle with it, but it still takes years of practice to get better at what we do. I mean, if you think about security, it's a practice, much like law, you know, or medicine. It, and it, yeah, medicine, because it's always evolving. Security projects are never one and done. The idea is security is ever evolving. You're always working on the next thing, right? We're always practicing our craft. And I would say the same thing is true about IT, but it's especially true about security. We continue to practice, right? And so th there's nothing wrong with that. You have to realize if you're going into it, that it will never be the same as somebody pressure washing a driveway. And I think about that a lot, right? There are days when our jobs are super stressful and it never ends, right? 
but yet I can go out and I can pressure wash my driveway and I'm done. I'm at least done for a long time, right? And so um, while you can learn it, the other thing you have to prepare for, especially I think in security, is being able to persevere. It's a tough job. You're always under attack. And so you have to have this mentality is that you can per persevere in the in the face of potential disaster. Yeah, I can I can definitely support that. When you look at your role and your career and you've been a leader for quite some time, I think you've got over 50 some odd publications that you've been a part of. You've been nominated and I think you've won multiple awards for either CIO of the year, innovator of the year and so forth over the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. Um, in the role you're doing, um, in all your publications and all your nominations and all the awards that you've won, what do you think are, are some of the key skills that have helped you get that recognition so that people look and, and nominate you for this stuff? Um, the, you know, I hope it's authenticity. Right. Okay. And, and what I say about that is, you know, I've, I've been exposed to a lot of great leaders, regardless of what area of business they came from, whether it be CIOs or COOs or CEOs. But I, I realized a few years ago, nobody's better at being me than me. And with all my flaws, and I have plenty, my wife can give you a whole list, right? I think everyone's <laughs> wife can give you a whole laundry <laughs> list worth of flaws. But what does he do good? Yeah, um, I, I have to, favorite food. Yeah, exactly. I have to just be me. And so being me means... I want to create that next generation of leadership. I want to use whatever position I've been given to try to help others. You know, uh, whether, you know, my late father told me when you take a job somewhere, uh, you may not stay forever, but you try to leave it better than you found it. I think at least all the jobs I've ever left, uh, all the positions I've been in, hopefully I've done that. Uh, I say hopefully because, um, I hope I have, but it won't be me to judge that. It'll be whoever's left after I'm gone. Right. And so nobody's going to remember at the end of their life, what digital transformation projects they did, or, you know, what was the latest, you know, security suite they put in or any of that, but they will remember, um, you know, who they worked with and the fun they had. And, you know, uh, people will remember how you made them feel. Right. And I think that's important. I, you know, I, I speak a lot these days on the importance of, paid parental leave and why that's important and why I think organizations should do that and why I think CIO should step up and say, look, we have spent a decade now in digital transformation. We are uniquely positioned as cultural change agents within our organization. How can we do something that impacts our employees in the next generation? And I'm not talking about companies that are 50 employees, right? You know, I'm talking about companies that are mid-tier and higher. We're the only modern country on earth that doesn't do paid parental leave, whether it be through birth or adoption. And it's important. You know, I, I'm, I was fortunate enough that when my second daughter was born, that health, we have paid parental leave. And I took off uh, about two months to help my wife. Uh, it was important. But at the same time, it also showed the industry if a CIO at a rapid growing SaaS organization can do it, so can you. And so... It also proves succession planning. If you're a leader, you have to prepare for the day that you're not there anymore. And so the good thing about childbirth is it doesn't happen overnight. You know, that gave me nine months of planning uh, to tell not only my C-level peers of what was going to happen while I was out, but also train my second in command to be ready for the day that I'm not there. So when he wants to grow his career and and step into that CIO role, he's had several months of true experience in doing that. And so succession planning is important. And so, um, you know, the awards are great. The publications are great, but uh, good or bad, I'm going to, I'm going to be me through all of it. I love that. Let's talk a little bit about IT and security. And so you, you know, we, I, I, the, this show is called CISO Talk because I often have a lot of CISOs. I like to diversify and bring CIOs and I'm glad yeah. you and I connected because I like your point of view on some of this stuff. And in the conversations we've had, you've actually helped me deal better with some of the stuff I needed to do on my day to day as a CISO. A lot of times CISO talk about the challenge of stepping outside of the IT function 
because security is more of a business enabler than it is just a singular IT function. As a CIO, how do you see the role of the CISO evolving in in industry? Yeah, I, I see it evolving and changing rapidly. And you're starting to see it at certain organizations. For, for a long time, uh, CISOs were sort of that part of IT and they reported into the CIO. Uh, what you are seeing now is an evolution where they're they're uh, outside of that organization. You know, some organizations are talking about maybe this uh, CISO should report to the board, right? Or maybe they should report to somebody other than you know uh, the, uh, another business leader. The reason is is ultimately you probably don't want, um, depending on the size of your organization, you don't you want that segregation of duties. You also want that segregation of duties because they can come in and say, whoa, why is this happening this way? You know, you don't want their voice to be stifled by their reporting manager, especially if they're technical. Uh, you know, the idea is um, they should be not only a risk mitigator to the business, but a great partner to the CIO. Uh, there are CIOs that ha uh, hold both the CISO title and the CIO title, and that's extremely hard. But for more mature organizations, they're they're segregated, and they're segregated in a way that you know they need to be able to partner um, with any of those roles in IT. Regardless of the role you have, you need others in order to be successful. The best um, CIOs have that CISO as a partner, right, and vice versa. Um, you want the same outcome. And that outcome is you don't want to be in the news. You don't want clients impacted. Uh, you don't want what's called an RGE, a resume generating event like a breach. And so you need those teams to work together. I do think what you're going to see is uh, those CISOs being a lot more publicly facing. And I don't mean necessarily going out and giving speeches and writing articles, but that is happening you're going to see them with a lot more visibility to the board. I think very mature boards are looking at uh, more than just the P&L. If you are a very smart board member, you want to know what your risk avoidance is. You want to know where do we stand on these threats? Where do we stand on the protection of our data? Uh, you know, everybody talks about data is the new oil. Well, data is oil in the sense that if it's not stored correctly, it becomes toxic. Uh, it creates an environmental disaster. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, really good boards are leaning on those CISOs to say, how are we avoiding this disaster? How are we protecting our assets? Um, you know, aside from our talent, our second greatest assets are data. Right. You know, people first, data second at many organizations. And so how are you protecting that data? And I think what you're going to see is it gives CISOs a really good chance to step up and be a lot more visible with the board. Eventually, what you'll probably see as that evolves over the next few years, that they may have board advisor seats or set on other boards. Right. You know, um, not just from a security perspective, but other industries. I think you'll eventually see that evolving. We're starting to see more CIOs on other boards, um, but I, eventually I think you'll also see the CISO as well. Yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. It is kind of the CIO-CISO relationship has always been one that's a bit more, I want to say, challenging, right? Because as a security, you're, you're almost auditing IT, but then you're mm -hmm. reporting to the person you're auditing. Yeah. Have you seen that be a challenge in your career? Oh, of course. And I, I think, you know, the ultimate idea is a leader in that position, especially if you're a CIO and a CISO is reporting to you, that their job is not to point out your flaws. Their job is to avoid risk. Um, any system has risk, right? Any any system that's software based, hardware based, there's going to be inherent risk. How are they helping you avoid that risk? And so, uh, think of them as your editor, right? If you're writing a book, you might be a great writer, but being a great writer doesn't make you a great editor. Before you publish that book, you want a great editor, and in a sense, that CISO becomes your great editor. They are keeping you out of the news in the, the in the worst possible way, and they're enabling you to deliver on your commitments to your clients. 
That's that's very true. Let's talk a little bit about kind of how CIOs view security as, you know, when, when the CISO reports to the CIO, how much time, you know, do CIOs really spend with the CISO and how critical is security for them? I think, if, that hat? I think if you look at what's been happening in the news, whether it be, you know, supply chain issues and uh, supply chain attacks or ransomware, I think really good COs are spending a hell of a lot more time with CISOs these days, right? Because it's, it's making sure that you're not impacted. I mean, if you look at the number of attacks that have occurred and number of industries impacted, I mean, it, it's everywhere. There, there's not a day goes by. If you look at what happened in Dusseldorf, Germany last year, there was a patient being transported to a hospital. The hospital got hit with ransomware. They had to reroute the patient. The patient died on route to the next hospital. Uh, originally, the German authorities were actually going to try this, not that they could find them, but try this uh, threat actors for murder, right? They, they since dropped that. But the idea is you don't want to be that organization, right? You don't want to be in the news. You also don't want the impact to, to live through a ransomware attack or a breach uh, is a horrendous thing. And so... I, I, I really hope CIOs, if you're not actively meeting with your CISOs, you need to change that now, right? They need to be part of your overall command structure. What are you doing to avoid risk? It's not about just delivering on digital transformation anymore. Uh, if, if you can't get to your data, none of your transformation projects are going to work, right? And none of your modernization projects are going to work if all of a sudden your data has been encrypted or it's well, even worse, encrypted and exfiltrated, right? You know, um, that's what we're seeing in threat actors. It's not just about, hey, we've 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 taken your encrypted data that you had in your safe and we put it in our safe and now you want it out of our safe, you got to give us money. Oh, by the way, we're going to extra uh, exfiltrate that data. And so you're going to get hit with penalties or, you know, uh, it, it's a scary world. And you know, you need that partnership. It's much like a good marriage. You need to work with them. You need to spend time with them. You need to make sure those lines of communication are open. This is not about looking for blame. You know, if they find that you haven't, your infrastructure team hasn't been going through adequate patch management, this is not about blame. This is about avoidance of risk. Take that just like you would really good feedback on a, uh, on a, you know, uh, a 360 peer review, right? It's the same kind of thing. And so you need to be working with them, need to deep dive. And by the way, CISOs, you need to be honest with your CIOs. If there is a damn issue, well, nobody in the world wants an Enron type uh, culture where everybody just sort of looked the other way. Your job is to make sure those, whoever you report to, whether it be the board or whether it be the CEO or the CIO or whoever it is, you need to be upfront, honest enough to say, here's where our risks are. Uh, here's the ones we should mitigate first because they're the highest risk. And here's where we are on that journey. Because it's, again, it's not a one and done. It is a continuous uh, process improvement. I love it. <clears throat> Time to hit the hot seat. All right. So for those who know, I ask six questions of every guest on the show. There are six fun questions, JJ, so you don't have to worry too much about it, all right? If you haven't been told, I added a buzzword to my buzzword graveyard yesterday. It's called demystifying. I hate the world demystifying. I think it's overused. Whenever someone sends me a webinar invite and they go, we're going to demystify, and I'm like, I'm going to smack you in the face. <laughs> Stop using the word demystify. You're not demystifying anything. There's no mystery behind any of this stuff. Right. Right. So what's one buzzword you'd want to get rid of and bury in my buzzword graveyard forever uh, and, ever, and never The new it? norm. I hate that shit. Right. <laughs> the idea is they're like, well, when we get back to the new norm, okay, let, let's go back to pre there's pre pandemic, post pandemic, right? Everybody's calling pre pandemic the normal. Was it normal to set in traffic for 90 minutes each day to get to work? 
it might have been normal, but it doesn't make it was right, right? And so I think what happens as we go into this post-COVID, post-pandemic world, right? That's just what we're facing. Things are going to evolve. I think there'll be millions of people that never return to an office Monday through Friday, nine to five. It might be a hybrid approach. It might be in two or three days a week. Some people may be fully remote, but stop using this term, the new norm. Uh, it just sounds, we're never going to get back to maybe where we were. You know, there will be an evolution every time we have a societal pivot. Right. And this was the largest societal impact since World War Two, much larger than 9-11, you know, because if you look at the amount of people impacted worldwide and what change, whether it be how we buy groceries or how we shop or how we work, major pivots. But uh, for the God's sakes, please stop using the new norm. Yeah, I I, I can join that. I, I hosted an event last week um, and. I told everyone in person this was a few weeks ago last week last week last week yeah yeah, last week about a week you know tuesday of last week and i said uh, welcome back everyone it's great to see your ugly faces again <laughs> right it was great i got to see people and hug them and it was unbelievable and um shake hands and we ate sitting two feet from each other you know possibly spitting on dessert who knows and I, I will say the first time you do that and we've done that with friends that have been fully vaccinated because we haven't done it in so long it just feels so odd the first time and so we do as we get back ac after covid i think we're we're going to you're going to see a massive explosion experience right it won't be people wanting to buy stuff it'll be people wanting to experience things whether it be you know, in-person dining or vacations or travel. Uh, but the the experience-driven economy is about to really take off. I, I you know, movie theaters were a dying breed before mm-hmm. the pandemic. <clears throat> I think they're going to come back big time. I think it's also going to change the way we go to a movie theater. I think movie theaters are now going to become more of a um, 3D, 4D, 7D kind of thing. It's going to be more uh, alcohol and beer and, 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 and food. food. And it's not just going to be the popcorn and Sour Patch Kids. Yeah. And Raisinets. If you go to a movie and you don't get popcorn, Sour Patch Kids, and Raisinets, you shouldn't be allowed to go to a movie. Don't, and Milk Duds. <laughs> and Milk Duds. Did I forget to say Milk Duds? I forgot Love to say Milk Duds. Duds. I had Milk Duds in so long. That sounds so good right now. Yeah. I, I may have to go get Milk Duds today. Um <laughs> What's one technology that you think is going to change the way cybersecurity is practiced going forward? Artificial intelligence, uh, all, all forms of artificial intelligence. When you think about it, not only from the automation side of it, and again, the idea to automate, whether it be, you know, the provision in, of systems. If you, if, if you take the convergence of security meets DevOps or IT ops or cloud ops or whatever you want to call it, But that ability that once it's automated and provisioned to come back and double check to verify, okay, did this patch occur? Has this been hardened? Have we moved it into the proper VLAN? Is the firewall ports uh, closed that are supposed to be? Have we set up, uh, you know, geofencing so it can only uh, get access from these IPs or zones or even geos? I think you're going to see a lot more automation in that sense. I think we're seeing a lot more automation and uh, artificial intelligence being brought to bear on monitoring. Um, So it's looking for very minute abnormalities, right? You know, if you look at any kind of logging and, you know, logging without proper intelligence just becomes noise. And so what we're finding is that uh, being able to pick up more minute things versus massive repeats, right? It, looking at it based on risk and the artificial intelligence to dig in and go, huh, we noticed this IP probed us seven months ago. Now it's back, right? What does that mean? Are they are they playing a long game? Um, and if, if you look at the long game approach with many threat actors, many of them were inside organizations for a long time before they executed anything. They gave them time to adequately map, to know where backups were, to know if backups were segregated, to know uh, where the systems weren't patched, how credentials may have been shared or misused, 
Uh, it gave them time from a long game to approach and know more about organizations' networks than even they did. I think what you'll find is that artificial intelligence will be brought to bear to better understand not only your network, your environment, but your data, but what also happens as access starts to occur with that data. I can definitely, um, I can definitely see that being, um, being a big thing. Um, artificial intelligence to me still not where it needs to be, yes, but I think it's gonna, right. it's it's going to get there. Right now, we have narrow AI, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of you know machine learning on a little bit more of steroids. Yep. Um, still don't have the engine of artificial intelligence fully figured out. Um, but yeah, I see, I see how AI is going to one automate a lot of different processes. I also think it's going to be able to analyze and spit out data. Like I, I, I'm starting to look at how big data can influence security as well, which I think to me is very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And big... probably a lot faster, more pragmatic approach to actually getting there before the artificial intelligence is even there. Right. Correct. If you, if you look at how people are using big data to analyze everything from, temperature trends post-surgery, you know, and be able to detect if infections occurring. That same kind of uh, kind of mindset could be brought to bear with looking at uh, network uh, anomalies to determine could there be a potential threat before there is a threat. That's 100% true. What's a book you're reading right now, JJ? Oh, so I, I will often go back and reread things. And so we are... Um, going back to Savannah uh, later this summer. And so um, for those of you who have not been to Savannah, you know, several years ago, it's probably been more than 20 years ago, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Brent was such a big hit. Uh, it's one of the best selling nonfiction books of all time. And it's about the, you know, uh, murder trial and, and all the surrounding character around Jim Williams. And so uh, I wanted to reread that. Uh, it had been probably 20 years. And so it, it, it reminds me of all the uniqueness of the people that live in Savannah, not only uh, those people, but, you know, uh, just, just the beauty of Savannah. And so uh, because we haven't been able to travel this last year, I wanted something that was nonfiction. And I also wanted something that was, um, you know, about a destination we were headed back to. And again, we haven't traveled in about a year. And so it, it seemed fitting. It wasn't one of the new books. I've got an entire list of books stacked over there that uh, I, I've got queued up, but I, I decided to pick an old one recently. That's awesome. What's the last movie you saw? Uh, what did we watch? So we, um, from a TV show perspective, um, my wife and I will binge stuff years after it's out. I don't think we saw Breaking Bad until like five years after it and then <laughs> enough of it. Lately, it's been focused on uh, watching The Crown. Uh, the last movie I saw was I stayed up late because I knew my wife wouldn't be interested. And that was the new Mortal Kombat movie. Yeah, I can see that. I, I you know, I, I, I've done that as well where, you know, my wife doesn't like action flicks. So yeah. if I want to watch something with blood shooting bombs and explosions, I got to kind of do it on my own. You know, and I thought from video game movies or video game to movies are, are generally dreadful. And I thought, uh, especially growing up in high school and playing that video game so much was that they were true to characters and as good as it could be. You know, uh, it's a still a Hollywood to, rendition of something. Yeah, it's a little blockbuster-ish, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, which we haven't had many blockbusters, and a few that have come out, like the new uh, Godzilla versus Kong, was just dreadful. Uh, and so uh, I, I'd had low expectations going into this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have. What's your favorite style of music that you like to listen to? Oh man, I have, I'm a huge fan of singer songwriters and people with lyrics. It was really sad this past year to lose John Prine. Uh, John Prine was such an important part of Americana and that style of music. Uh, I have very diverse music tastes. My first two jobs in Atlanta were all digital music. Uh, and so, you know, if you look at my uh, catalog, uh, just even before we got on, I was listening to everything from John Prine to Eminem to the Evett brothers is, is all over the place though. But it, anything that refocuses on story, I think is important. 
regardless of uh, of what genre of music. That's why I was so um, you know fascinated by John Prine. Willie Nelson just celebrated his 88th uh, birthday this past week. He's the only uh, uh, living man old enough to know uh, when a dime bag actually cost a dime. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, his, his music is, I'll be super sad the day he's, he's no longer on this earth. Uh, from the simple fact is, man, you're talking about stories growing up in poor part of Texas and this, he's elevated above the genre of music he's in, right? And part of it was because of story. So our last question here before we wrap up, what's one thing that you took away from Solar Winds? Oh man, that even even the greatest, most recognized brands um, can make really bad decisions. You know, as great of products as Solar Winds has done over the years, they underinvested in talent, they underinvested in leadership, and that may not be the entire reason why this occurred, but when it occurred, they scrambled to put people in those positions. And I think that was ultimately disappointing to see. Um, you know, for the longest time, they didn't even have a CIO, right? And for the longest time, um, you know, when you go through, and I'm not saying every organization needs a CIO, but you need strong leadership. You need strong leadership before the disaster occurs. You need somebody there to reassure your teams that you can get through this. You need strong leadership to reassure your clients that you'll get through this. Every comp company is susceptible attack. And that's not a that's not a slight against solar winds. If you look at the amount of attacks that have occurred against Microsoft and Google and others, uh, the sheer fact is uh, if a nation state comes after you, they're probably getting in. It's how do you respond to it? How do you respond to your teams? How do you respond to your clients? And scrambling to get leadership after the fact was a disappointing for a company that could have done it prior. Yeah. Um, Solar Winds is a lot of things, but you know, you're the first to bring up the whole lack of leadership there, which I think is a, it's a very, very um, wise outlook on it beyond just they were attacked by Russia and China simultaneously. They, lack of leadership allowed that to happen they made themselves a very easy target yeah they left the hen house open for the wolves to come in yeah and the, and the problem with it when the, the wolves were attacking the hens you know if you're going through that and as a team member it's super hard and who do you lean on right because i guarantee when that occurred and the news broke for many of those that worked on the team it was the worst career week of their life, if not year of their life, right? And not having that leadership in place didn't allow them to be buffered. So they could do their job to harden environments and get back on track. It also um, sort of pointed the fingers elsewhere. I mean, you know, I, you know, we're hearing responses about, you know, people blaming interns and stuff. It's like, you know, at some point, why did interns have certain access to environments? You know, at the end of the day, as a leader, you have to take the responsibility. It does. And that's absolutely true. Um, JJ, thank you for coming on the show, man. Thanks for I'm having me. I'm grateful that you took time today to, to spend time with us here and, and with me and, and sharing. And this was a magnificent episode with so much insight. Um, and and I can't wait to have you on again and and look at you know some of the stuff we talked about today and see a year from now what it looks like. Be glad and, to. And 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 so forth, um, folks. That's it for today's show. Um, please go to tiltify.com. Look up the Sisal Talk Paisley Shirt Challenge. We're at twenty seven hundred dollars, twenty seven hundred and twenty six dollars as of the time of recording this. This is Friday, May seventh. We need to get $5,000 in support of the Wounded Warrior Project. You get to see me in more ugly paisleys once we hit 5000 I may do a 3500 goal just for you guys, just to kind of incentivize you um, to get there. So you can see that link below in the show notes as well. Uh, I forgot to mention that early in the show, so I wanted to bring it up here. We'll be back next week with another episode of CISO Talk. Tune in daily, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time for my live practitioner brief where you can find out what's happening from a risk, impact, and mitigation perspective in your security organizations and world. And it's not just clickbait headlines. It's actual actionable stuff that we can do 
to really defend against some of the latest threats that are emerging their heads against our organizations, technology, software, hardware, and people. So you can do that as well. Another Sizzle Talk drop next week on Wednesday. Until then, folks, have a great rest of your day, night, evening, weekend, morning, whenever you're listening to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Please make sure to subscribe and look us up. We'll be back with a lot more then. Until then, cheers. And JJ, thanks again, buddy. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast and share it with your friends and colleagues. And get all the latest information at cyberhubpodcast.com.